son las palabras en español primero y luego en inglés. Eh, bueno, pues hoy tenemos esta charla del profesor Cayita, eh, el premio Nobel de Física 2015, y bueno, van a aprender un imagino sobre el neutrino. Y eh, bueno, es, este, le damos la bienvenida. Y también quisiera eh, comentar que tenemos esta transmisión tanto en otra sala, aquí en el Instituto y en la Facultad de Ciencias de la UNAM, que también se, se enlazaron para todos los estudiantes que, que estén interesados en, en escuchar la charla. Eh, now I should switch to uh, Welcome to the Physics Institute to UNAM. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here. Uh, I guess, uh, as you said, you, you, you will give a, a talk about the, the new frontiers of the research, uh, about uh, physics, which is uh, very important to us. And uh, uh, thank you to the HOC uh, collaboration who made uh, this uh, uh, visit uh, here. And uh, well, thank you, and Professor Sandoval will be introduced you and welcome again. Bienvenidos a todos. Uh, welcome, Professor Cayeta. Uh, we are very happy to have you here in Mexico, and we hope to see you soon back here again. Uh, Professor Cayeta. Uh, studied at the Saitama University in Japan and did his PhD in 1986 at the University of Tokyo. He was working in the what then was the Kamioka, Kamiokande experiment uh, under Professor Masatoshi uh, Koshiba and they were looking, this experiment was looking for the proton decay it was a very big uh, water tank underground, uh, full covered with uh, photomultipliers, looking for a signal of a proton decay into neutrinos and muons. His uh, thesis uh, title is uh, Search for Nuclear Decays into Antineutrino Plus Mesons. And as he says, there was no signal. <laughs> so, he and nevertheless got his PhD, <laughs> and he stayed uh, at the Kamiokande experiment still as a postdoc for another year. And uh, since he, I think he didn't look very thoroughly for a new postdoc, he was offered in a second year, what was kind of unusual at that time, but uh, uh, he was then awarded a second year and during the second year is when he discovered this signal of a, a de decrease in the muon uh, neutrino, muon neutrino signal. And that's what led to his appointment to the uh, Institute of Cosmic Radiation Research of the University of Tokyo, where he joined it in 1988. And he started working in the next experiment after Kamiokande, a much bigger uh, volume of water, what's called Super Kamiokande, now looking directly for neutrino physics. And uh, in this experiment is where they finally could uh, verify the neutrino oscillations, which led to the Nobel Prize in, 19, in 2015. Yeah, so we are very happy to have him today here. Uh, he is director of the institute since uh, uh, 19, sorry, 1988, sorry, in 2015, 2015 he was gained. 2008. 2008, he became director of the institute, he has been since then director of the institute, and he will tell us now about the research at the institute for cosmic ray research at the University of Tokyo. Welcome.
Okay, um, thank you very much for this occasion to speak about our institute. <laughs> well, so in this uh, talk, I'd like to um, tell you what we are doing in our institute, that is Institute for Cosmic Ray Research. And well, of course, with the name of Cosmic Ray Research, we are essentially exploring the high energy universe. Okay, well, this is the outline of this talk. Uh, first, I have a brief introduction of our institute, and then I, I'd like to move on to uh, several um, projects, scientific projects, that we are carrying out now. First is the uh, Neutrino project, Super Kamiokande, Gravitational Waves, Kagura, Gamma Rays, CTA, Highest Energy Cosmic Rays, Telescope Array, Cosmic Rays and Gamma Rays, Tibet AS Gamma Experiment, and Alpaca Experiment. Okay. <coughs> well, first of all, I want to tell you about the history of our institute. Well, the original, uh, well, originally, in 1953, we had a Cosmic Ray Observatory at the Noikura Mountain, and okay, so this is the uh, photo taken around 1960 at the Noikura Mountain. We had observatory there. Then in 1976, Institute for Cosmic Ray Research of the University of Tokyo was established. And, well, this was the reorganization re from the observatory at the Norikura Mountain. Then, um, well, from now on, I, I want to mention about the uh, key years related to the um, key, uh, key science projects. Uh, first, in 1987, uh, first committee for the ICRR future project submitted its report and Super Kamiokande was the top priority project. And then in 1991, uh, construction of Super K was approved and the experiment started in 96. In 93, the construction of the Tibet AS Gamma experiment started. 2003, the construction of the telescope array started at Utah, <coughs> and the experiment started in 2008. Then, in 2010, the construction of the Kagura gravitational wave project started, and as I mentioned later, the construction finished this year. Also last year, uh, the first CTA LST telescope was constructed at La Palma. So, this is the uh, very rough history of our institute. We have been um, working on various aspects of cosmic rays. <coughs> and this is the map of the ICRR-related facilities. Um, <coughs> so, in Japan, well, first of all, our institute is located there which is near Tokyo, but outside of Tokyo. Then we have two big facilities uh, in the mountain area here. One is Super Kamiokande, another is the Kagura Gravitational Wave Detector. Then we have um, Tibet AS Gamma Experiment, of course in Tibet. Um, we have CTA North uh, in La Palma. Telescope Array in Utah, and we have the plan to have the alpaca project in Bolivia. <coughs> so from now on, we, I want to introduce each project rather briefly. <coughs> uh, first, neutrinos. <coughs> well, okay, so Super Kamiokande uh, started its experiment in 1996. <coughs> um, well, this is a big neutrino detector. It is a 50 
third and tone water detector. And you can see uh, this is a, a big water tank. It's about 40 meters in diameter and 40 meters in height. And the inside is covered by the array of photomath dryer tubes. And if a neutrino interaction occurs inside the detector, um, we detect chain of photons produced by the secondary particles. And the first result, um, a major result from this experiment came in 1998. Well, <coughs> um, this was a slide we used for the presentation at the conference more than 20 years ago. Well, at that time, we didn't have PowerPoint. <laughs> so we, we used this kind of plastic. And, well, actually, this was the, uh, this, this, this shows the zinc sangu distributions for electron neutrino events and neuron neutrino events. And one means uh, down-going neutrinos, and minus one means upward-going neutrinos. And these uh, small black circles with the error bars show the data, and these are the expectations. And you can see for muon neutrinos and for upward going neutrinos, you can see almost a factor of two deficit, while there is no evidence for the deficit of muon neutrinos for down going neutrinos. And this was the very clear evidence for neutrino oscillations. And in fact, um, at that time, Super Kamiokan collaboration analyzed um, various other types of uh, neutrinos. Ah, by the way, this was the contained neutrino events. And the overall neutrino oscillation analysis suggested that <coughs> um, well, the data are completely consistent with the neutrino oscillations, and therefore, uh, into, in, in 1998, Super Kamiokane concluded that observed the de dependent deficit, and the other supporting data gave ev evidence for neutrino oscillations. <coughs> also, um, Super Kamiokande studied solar neutrinos, and the first very important result came when we combine the data from Super Kamiokande with the slow uh, charged current measurement. Well, snow measures the uh, electron neutrino flux by the charged current interaction. On the other hand, Super Kamiokande observes solar neutrinos by neutrino electron scattering. And in this uh, uh, process, Super Kamiokande is mostly sensitive to electron neutrinos. However, this is also sensitive to the new neutrino plus tau neutrinos with the reduced cross section by a factor of seven or so. And then we compared these two results, and then we found that the super K uh, measurement, measured flux was a bit higher than the slow measured flux. And that discrepancy was interpreted as the evidence for new, new, new plus new tau flux. And therefore, this was the first evidence for neutrino, solar neutrino oscillations. Well, to be honest, at that time, the statistical significance was um, more than three sigma, but less than four sigma. Therefore, with that data alone, um, people are not really convinced to the as, as solar neutrino oscillations. But soon after, Snow had more direct evidence for oscillations with the neutral current measurement. <coughs> then, um, oh, by the way, I have to say, uh, Super Kamiokande experiment was essentially, um, say, no accelerator physics experiment designed to be um, observing neutrinos produced by various um, mechanisms such as stars, atmosphere, or uh, supernova. But fortunately, um, 
in Japan, we had um, a protorock accelerators at KEK in Tsukuba. Then the distance between the proto accelerator there and Super K was 250 kilometers. And therefore, people proposed to use the accelerator beam to produce neutrinos to the direction of Super Kamiokande and to confirm the neutrino oscillations uh, by the man-made neutrino beam. And this experiment was carried out between 1999 and 2004. And this is the data from this K2K experiment. And well, clearly, the energy spectrum of the data disagree with the no oscillation prediction that is shown by Bru, and rather good agreement with the uh, oscillation assumption, which is shown by red. And this way, um, K2K experiment confirmed uh, neutrino oscillations. <coughs> Furthermore, more luckily, uh, in Japan, there was a um, plan around 2000, year 2000, to construct a very high, very high intensity proton accelerator, which is called JPAC. And in fact, JPAC was constructed um, between two, two, around, around 2000, 2008 or so. And therefore, people had a plan to use this accelerator to produce the very high intensity neutrino beam to other direction of super K. The distance was almost 300 kilometers. And in fact, in that stage, the science target was, the, was different. Uh, with this experiment, they would like to observe the third neutrino oscillation channel. That was the mu neutrino oscillation oscillating to tau, no, sorry, mu neutrino oscillating to electron neutrino instead of tau neutrino. And in fact, this experiment beautifully confirmed the electron neutrino appearance in the mu neutrino beam. And this was the e evidence for three flavor oscillation effect. Okay, so far I discussed the uh, super Kamiokande oscillation physics. Now, cooperation is thinking a little bit different thing. Well, of course, you know this is the uh, um, cartoon of the universe. Um, well, uh, the universe began there and we are here. And during the uh, evolution of the universe, a supernova explosion occurred. And in each supernova explosion, tremendous number of neutrinos are produced. And these neutrinos should be still propagating in our universe. Therefore, we'd like to observe um, the neutrinos produced by past supernova explosion. And that way, we'd like to observe the, uh, possibly, the supernova explosion history. <coughs> Unfortunately, the present super Kamiokande is actually not powerful enough to observe uh, this kind of supernova neutrino events because there are, well, actually I would say, but well, maybe I, sh I should explain in the next page. Well, um, this is the reaction that we observe supernova neutrinos. So super, super Kamiokande is essentially sensitive to anti-electron neutrinos. So we'd like to observe the anti-electron neutrino interactions. However, there are background events. They are coming from, say, for example, the atom spec neutrino interactions. But many of the atom spec neutrino interactions are actually uh, neutrino interactions, not anti-neutrino interactions. Therefore, people had an idea to tag the neutron in addition to the positron signal produced by the new e bar plus proton interaction. And in order to detect this neutron, um, people 
had an idea to put gadolinium into the super Kamiokande tank. Then the neutrons are efficiently captured by gadolinium. Then, as a result, gamma rays with the total energy of about 80 MeV are produced, and therefore um, prompt E plus signal and delayed um, neutron capture 80 MeV gamma ray signals should be observed. <coughs> then the question is how much gadolinium we need? And then this gives you the idea. Um, here the um, horizontal axis is the uh, gadolinium su sulfate concentration. And if we have 0.02% um, gadolinium sulfate, then the neutron capture efficiency is about 50%. Or if we have 0.2%, then it will be about 90%. So this way, we'd like to tag this reaction <coughs> by observing the uh, neutron capture gamma rays. And then this is the expected signal and background after 10 years of gadolinium into the super Kamiokande tank. And here, the blue histogram shows the total background, and these, the, these red, uh, green, and black histograms show the expected signal. And depending on the model of the uh, supernova neutrinos energy spectrum, we would expect between 2 sigma and 4 point some sigma signal after 10 years of super KGD. Well, we had this idea already around 2004. Unfortunately, Super, Kamiok Super Kamiokande had a problem, to be honest. Super Kamiokande had a leak. Well, every day, more than one ton of the water was leaked somewhere in the 40 meter by 40 meter tank. Well, actually, we knew this problem from, from the beginning of the experiment. And whenever we opened the super Kamiokande tank, we tried to fix the leak. But we never completely successful. So therefore, last year, we had a major operation. So here, as you can see, for every possible leak position, we had a special painting. And we actually, this worked quite, quite well. And well, now we confirmed with this treatment, there is no more leak. <coughs> so, Super Kamiokande has resumed the data taking in January this year. And probably Super KGD with 0.02% gadolinium sulfate will begin in the spring of 2020, next year. And eventually, we'd like to increase the gathering concentration, but we do not know when we, we will do this. Anyway, uh, this project will begin soon. Now, uh, one more word about the uh, uh, Neutrino project. Well, I think, or, or everybody thinks, that Kamiokande and Super Kamiokande were very successful. And people realized neutrino physics is very important. And therefore, we proposed hyper Kamiokande. And hyper Kamiokande will be essentially al al almost 10 times bigger than present super K as far as the volume for physics analysis is concerned. It will be about 70 meters in diameter and 70 meters in height. And the total and the fiducial volumes are 0.2. 2.6 and 0.19 megatons, respectively. And in particular, uh, we'd like to carry out a neutrino oscillation with the neutrino oscillation experiment with the JPAC neutrino beam. And in particular, we'd like to study if CP is violated in the neutrino sector. And the measurement will be done by using the neutrino beam and the anti-neutrino beam. And if we observe the difference in the oscillation pattern between the neutrino beam and the anti-neutrino beam, 
that is the evidence for CP violation. And in fact, um, the parameter of the experiment was uh, optimized to, to observe this effect. Furthermore, of course, because of this big detector, we'd like to have another studies. And of course, this is a huge experiment. Therefore, this should be an international project. And at present, we have more than 300 members from 17 countries. <coughs> but well, this is, in fact, a, not, a pro, not a collaboration yet protocol collaboration, because uh, so far uh, the government is not approving the super, uh, hyper cameo candy yet. But this year, on August 29th, our funding agency, NEXT, has submitted the, its budget request, including hyper K, to the Ministry of Finance. The, and, and the released materials said, in addition to the ongoing 13 large-scale projects, the next generation neutrino research project Hyper Kamiokande will be newly launched in fiscal year 2020. Then there was a big, um, well, newspaper articles. Well, of course, this is still a budget request from Ministry of Education, Science, Culture to the uh, Ministry of Finance. So the final decision is not made yet. And we are eagerly waiting for the decision by the government. And this decision will be announced at the end of December this year, in a month. So we are really waiting for. What is the projected budget? Um, OK, um, the Japanese portion of the budget, including the accelerator upgrade, will be around 600 million U.S. dollars. <laughs> and of course, we, we need the another budget from the uh, other countries. The total budget will be about... Uh, about... Uh, oh, no, no, no. Uh, no, 800. Slightly less than... Um, around 800 million U.S. dollars. Japan will be paying for the most of it. Yes, yes. Well, because accelerator modification should be done by Japanese, and the excavation must be done by Japanese money. So we have a constraint. Well, many of the uh, equipment used in the detector are from the foreign countries. Now, I would like to move on to the next uh, topic, gravitational waves, uh, that, that, that is the Kagura project. Um, first of all, of course, you know, the uh, gravitational wave was discovered in 2015 by the LIGO project. Then after that, <laughs> well, this is based on the paper, published paper. Uh, so far, 10 mergers of binary black holes were observed. In addition, uh, Lago and Virgo observed the uh, merger of binary neutron stars. And in fact, this event was um, followed by the optical telescopes. They had a very successful follow-up observations. And with these observations, we knew that heavy metals such as gold or platinum were produced by the merger of the binary neutron stars. So, in the last few years, we had many exciting news, and I'd like to congratulate the LIGO and Virgo collaborations. So, it's clear that we can do many important science with gravitational wave if we do it right. So, we'd like to contribute to this field and therefore, we have the Kagura gravitational wave detector, uh, which, is, uh, which was constructed in, the, in underground in Kamino, Kamioka. And in fact, 
here you can see Super Kamio Kande. So in the same mountain, we constructed the uh, Kagura 3 km by 3 km laser interferometer. So with the underground site, uh, we expect the seismic noises are almost two orders of magnitude smaller. And therefore, this is a quite an advantage to, to install the detector in underground. Furthermore, <coughs> we use mirrors with the cryogenic temperature, 20 Kelvin. And this way, we can reduce the thermal noise. That is quite an advantage. So this is the uh, uh, idea. And this is the timeline of the Kagura construction. The project was approved in 2010. Then immediately after that, we started the preparation work. And that's, a, well, a slightly later, we had the uh, excavation of the underground site. Then in 2016, we had the initial uh, interferometer test operation with the three kilometer arm. Then, in in the spring of 2018, we had the another um, test operation with one, one mirror cooled down to the cryogenic temperature. Then the, the construction continued, and finally, in the spring, we finished the construction. And we are now in the commissioning phase. <coughs> well, OK, I, I want to show you several photos of the cover construction. Um, first of all, uh, this is the vacuum tube of three kilometers. And these vacuum tubes were installed in February 2015. And this is the photo of the central area of the laser interferometer. And well, of course, you unfortunately, um, you cannot see clearly. You can only see the plastic tent. <laughs> These are the cream booths, and in in the cream booths there are many vacuum tanks. Um, we suspend mirrors in these vacuum tanks by the vibration isolation system. <coughs> so well. This photo was actually rather new, and already we have finished the installation. And OK, this is a mirror to be cooled down to 20 Kelvin. <coughs> and in fact, this is a sapphire with 22 centimeter diameter and 15 centimeter in thickness, and the weight is 23 kilogram. And, and this photo shows the, um, um, the moment that we finished the installation of the first cryogenic mirror into the huge cryos that you can see o over there. It's a big vacuum tank whose diameter is 2.7 meters and the height is almost 4 meters. And the first cryogenic mirror was installed in November 2017, and the last one was installed one year ago. <coughs> OK, that way we finished the uh, construction of the interferometer. And then um, this uh, photo shows the um, surface building, surface office, located here. Here is the interferometer, and here is the surface office. And this, in this office, we have the control room and the um, operation of, and in fact, the commissioning and every testing is down here in this control room. <coughs> and well, as I said, we have finished the uh, construction. Therefore, now our work is, work location is here for the commissioning. <coughs> and, well, of course, uh, Kagura will not be alone. Well, we do a single laser interferometer, even if we seem to observe some signal, we are not sure. 
Therefore, definitely we are going to collaborate with Raiwa and Virgo. Furthermore, if we have the simultaneous detection of the gravitational wave signals from LIGO, Virgo, and Kagura, then we can precisely determine the source location, source location. Therefore, it's really important to work together in, <coughs> in the global gravitational wave community. <coughs> and, well, certainly Kagura plans to join the present observation, which is called Observation 3 or O3. And hopefully, we'd like to begin the observation by the end of this year. But unfortunately, to be honest, our sensitivity is not good enough. So we are not sure if we can really begin the observation by the end of this year. But anyway, um, by the end of all three, which is scheduled at the end of April next year, we definitely run the Kagura interferometer. And after all three, um, we definitely work together, and Kagura will always join observation runs. <coughs> now, I want to move on to the other topic, gamma rays. <coughs> well, <coughs> well, now, the well, classical motivation of gamma rays. Well, of course, for many years, almost 100 years, we'd like to know how the cosmic rays are accelerated and where these particles are accelerated. But unfortunately, due to the geomagnetic, no, the magnetic field in the universe, um, even if we precisely determine the cosmic ray direction, we, we, we have no idea where is the uh, gamma ray source, uh, no, cosmic ray source. Therefore, we need the gamma ray observation. Of course, Neutrinos are also very important uh, messenger, but for this talk, I completely skip. And now, um, the Japanese group is joining the MAGIC collaboration uh, that is located in La Palma, Spain. <coughs> and these two uh, telescopes are the MAGIC telescopes. And <coughs> I simply want to show you just one recent news. Uh, that is the detection of the TED gamma rays um, from the gamma ray burst GRB uh, 1901-14C. And this is the time profile of the magic detection of the gamma rays. So clearly, uh, uh, so this is 1,000 seconds. So they observed a very long uh, gamma ray signals, TV gamma ray signals. And furthermore, very striking thing is, actually this gamma ray is rather, f well, not, not nearby, not galactic source. Therefore, the, this gamma ray source is far. And therefore, these gamma rays are attenuated while propagating in the universe. And if they have the correction of the attenuation, then they found that the spectrum is rather hard. So this was really a uh, very exciting news. And this was, in fact, I think the first um, ambiguous detection of the TV gamma rays from GRB. So this is just one example. But clearly, with gamma rays, um, we have um, many, many sciences to be carried out. <coughs> I don't want to go into detail of these uh, sources, but because of this, um, the Japanese community has decided to join CTA. In particular, um, uh, in the CTA, CTA notes, um, sorry, the large, large telescopes in the CTA notes, uh, in, we are committed. Um, well, this is the image of the uh, La Palma after the completion of the CTA telescopes. 
So there should be four large size telescopes together with uh, more than 10 mid sized telescopes and um, magic telescopes. <coughs> and I'd like to show you the status. Well, slightly more than one year ago, we had the inauguration of the first CTA LST telescope. And this is the first CTA LST, which has 23 meters in diameter. And we said, oh, thank you, we, I have. <laughs> We have celebrated the uh, completion of the construction of the first, first LST. And this is the timeline of CTA LST in the north. Um, um, first, budget for the four LSTs has been allocated in Japan, and the equipment that the Japanese team are in charge that uh, mirrors, photo tubes, fly wheel, uh, on-site computers, and so on have been purchased. And we, we are ready to begin the on-site construction of the second to fourth CTA LSTs. And we hope to complete the construction of four LSTs um, in sometime in 2021. Of course, this is still a hope, but anyway. <clears throat> now, okay, again, I want to change the topic. That is the highest energy cosmic rays um, telescope array. Uh, well, as you know, this is the cosmic ray energy spectrum. And well, the highest energy is around 10 to 20 electron volt. And we'd like to know what is the spectrum at the end of cosmic ray spectrum. And of course, we'd like to know how and where these cosmic rays are accelerated. Well, 10 to 20 electron volt is a huge energy. So we, we are really interested in how these particles are accelerated. Unfortunately, in order to study these uh, highest energy cosmic rays, we have to realize that the flux is very low. And therefore, we need a huge array of uh, cosmic ray detectors. And in fact, we have the telescope array in Utah. And here is the uh, surface array. Um, for the surface array, we have about 500 scintillation detectors with 1.2 kilometer spacing. Therefore, the total uh, surface coverage is around 700, kilometers, uh, 700 square kilometers. In addition, there are three fluorescence detectors. Um, they would like to observe, they observe the uh, shower development by observing the fluorescence light. And um, well, here, here is this telescope station, and here and here, uh, this kind of telescope station. And um, by the way, this is the surface detector. <coughs> and well, okay, this is telescope array, and of course, in the southern hemisphere, uh, there is um, the OJ uh, project. And of course, um, we, we are measuring the um, energy spectrum at the uh, endpoint energy region. And this is the comparison of um, the energy spectrum from <coughs> TA or telescope array, which is shown by these um, black dots and compared with the OJ data, which are shown by these uh, blue dots. So clearly, uh, until some energy uh, energy, the, these two data agreed quite well. However, in the highest energy region, both of uh, the projects observed the steepening, very rapid speed steepening of the spectrum, but the steepening point seems to be slightly different. So this has been an uh, issue. 
Now people are studying more. Uh, first of all, TA in the north and OJ in the south have that common declination band, which is between minus 15 to plus 25 or so. Then they found that the uh, cutoff energy is essentially completely agreed. Then TA had another study, and this, they checked the energy spectrum in the low, um, low declination, less than 25 degree, and high declination. Then they found that the cutoff um, energy is different with the statical significance at around 4 sigma. So it seems this spectrum difference at the endpoint energy is real. <coughs> now, there's an, another question. What kind of particles are coming in the highest energy region? And in fact, this is a very difficult measurement. Well, typically people measure the shower development in the atmosphere and by measuring the depth, they would like to know if the primary particles are protons or heavy particles. And here, well, I don't go into detail, but here, um, the, um, this is the uh, shower maximum position as a function of the energy. And these are the data, and these are the Monte Carlo predictions uh, assuming different primary particles put on to iron. Then clearly TA data in this energy range uh, suggest light component. Also, the, they also measure the fluctuation of the uh, highest uh, shower maximum point. Then um, again, data suggest um, light component. But, well, for this question, um, I, as far as I understand, TA and OJ data are quite similar, but their interpretations are quite different. So we have not clear answer to the composition of the highest energy particles. <coughs> and furthermore, TA had an, another interesting data. Here, um, here shows the uh, um, arrival direction distribution of the highest energy cosmic rays, and they found a hot spot. Unfortunately, well, this is the newest data. Unfortunately, the statistical significance um, was uh, slightly reduced when uh, uh, compared with the data they published um, some time ago. And, well, in fact, this shows the um, number of events they observed as a function of year, and recently <laughs> the event rate decreased, but maybe this is statistical, statistical fluctuation. So, uh, well, this is clearly very interesting. Uh, this may be the first hint telling us the um, location of the accelerator of the highest energy cosmic rays, but, well, of course, with the uh, statistical, statistical significance of about three sigma, it cannot be conclusive. And therefore, um, the, the telescope array group propo proposed to extend the surface coverage by a factor of four. And in fact, uh, this um, proposal was approved. Um, people started the construction of the, uh, this is the deployment of the surface array, and this is the new fluorescence detectors to see the other array locations. And, well, so this project is ongoing, and they, well, also they told us, told me, 
they have slightly deficit of the budget. Anyway, <laughs> they have some kind of extension. So um, we hope um, they, they begin the high statistics of observation of the uh, highest energy cost in grades. <laughs> now, now <coughs> uh, finally, I, I want to discuss the uh, galactic cosmic rays and gamma rays. That is Tibet AS gamma and alpaca experiment. Well, the energy range relevant to these experiments are here. So we think this is the transition from galactic to extra galactic cosmic rays. And of course, we'd like to confirm this picture. And <clears throat> furthermore, we'd like to know the origin of galactic cosmic rays. And of course, for this, we need, the, we need to observe gamma rays. And finally, um, we could use these cosmic rays as a probe of the solar system studies. <laughs> and the Tibet AS gamma experiment is, of course, located in Tibet at the altitude of uh, 4,300 meters. <laughs> and it is a um, mid size array of uh, 66,000 square meters meters. And the array is like this. And in the central area, they have added four water pools in underground. <laughs> and with this, um, they would like to um, separate the usual cosmic rays and the gamma rays. In fact, um, <coughs> at the 100 TV energy range, they have the uh, 99.9% .9 cosmic ray rejection with the 90% gamma ray detection efficiency. <coughs> now, uh, I'd like to um, show you several um, key results from the Tibet AS gamma experiment. Well, they have started the experiment already in 1996, I guess, and they continued, and they continue to observe the uh, sun's shadow on cosmic rays. And this is the uh, annual variation of the depth of the sun's shadow. Then you notice, depending on the year, the depth is quite different. And in fact, this difference in the depth is due to the solar activity. <coughs> if the solar activity is high, then, as you can see, the depth of the shadow is minimum. So, they have this kind of uh, long-range data. And with this, they studied the solar magnetic field models. Well, to be honest, I don't know what are these models. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> according to them, <laughs> They study two models, and, and here um, they show the data and the comparison with the expected depth of these uh, shadows, and then they found um, that this PFSS model is disfavored. <coughs> In fact, they have continuing this kind of studies and they are getting deeper and deeper, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to follow their studies. But anyway, this way, uh, cosmic rays are used to study solar magnetic field. <laughs> and also, um, they have uh, modified the detector to, to be able to reject cos usual cosmic rays. And with this, um, uh, this experiment measured the uh, gamma rays about 100 TeV. And this is the first result from the Tibet AS gamma experiment on the very high energy gamma rays. And this is actually from CRAB. And the Tibet data are shown by red, and the Hawk data are shown by orange. And these two data agree quite well. And the highest energy observed by Tibet AS gamma is actually 450 TeV. 
So, and this is the first detection of photons with energy over 100 TeV. <coughs> okay, well, they continued the experiment in Tibet. But, well, clearly, um, if we want to study more on the very high energy gamma rays, um, it is natural uh, to, to go to the South Hemisphere because, well, so in the South, South Hemisphere, there should, the, there should be much richer in the 100 TV gamma rays. <coughs> and therefore, they would like to have a new detector in, in, in Bolivia near Chakarataya. Here is the uh, map. Here is the uh, Chakarata Observatory on Cosmic Rays, and here is the uh, location of the new experiment called Alpaca, and here is La Paz. And, <coughs> and, well, furthermore, well, of course, I said the uh, motivation for the 100 TV gamma rays, but furthermore, uh, near the equator, the sun is always rise, the sun always, sorry, sun always rises, uh, to high elevation. Therefore, this is better for the studies of sun with cosmic rays. Furthermore, uh, cosmic ray anisotropy, which is not discussed today, is important to be carried out in the southern hemisphere. And finally, um, the Japanese cosmic ray physicist had a um, long, long, that means about a half a century of collaboration with the Bolivian cosmic ray physicist. And therefore, an um, alpaca project is uh, planned. And uh, this is the current uh, alpaca design. Well, this is, in fact, quite similar to, to the Tibet AS gamma experiment. Uh, the total um, um, array size is slightly larger than the current Tibet experiment, but the concept is quite similar. And with this, um, uh, here, here summarizes the uh, sensitivity and the expectations. Well, as far as the gamma ray point sources are concerned, uh, alpaca should be better than CTA in the 100 TV energy range. Of course, here they assume CTA has 50 hours of uh, observation time, and alpaca they assumed five years or 10 years. I, I don't know which was used. <coughs> uh, furthermore, as I said, in the, uh, in the alpaca site, the sun is always in the high, uh, high angle. Therefore, uh, they can continue observing the uh, solar effect. And here is the cosmic ray anisotropy. And northern part is covered by many uh, observatories. But uh, in the southern hemisphere, the South Pole um, array is measuring, but uh, there is a um, gap. And also, in the southern array, the station of energy is higher. So there is a reason to have the uh, cosmic ray anisotropy in the southern hemisphere. So that is the physics. And <clears throat> well, of course, um, this is just an essentially an early stage and clearly um, for example the design is still an um, early stage and furthermore we think that I, at least I think or we think um, this collaboration needs to be more stronger we need more collaboration collaborators from many other countries at present uh, this is a Japan-Bolivia collaboration, but this collaboration should be largely expanded. Anyway, since we have idea, um, in order to prove that we can have an experiment, large size experiment in Bolivia, we have to prove and therefore, we have the prototype experiment called, called Alpaquita. And here, the infrastructure is prepared by the Bolivian collaborators. 
And then the Japanese collaborators are now preparing the prototype array um, with 20, approximately 20% 20 of the full alpaca array. And in fact, um, well, they would like to uh, have this area of array. <coughs> and the array will be prepared, already started the preparation and prepared by next year. In addition, um, they plan to have uh, one underground neuron detector. One or two, maybe two. <coughs> and <coughs> this way, we'd like to establish the procedures in Bolivia, construction, import, export, infrastructure, and so on. And also, we have to have some early science to demonstrate the importance of the alpaca uh, array. So we are in this stage, but of course, we are quite early, and we would like to expand, expand uh, the uh, collaboration. Very well, we hope to expand very much. OK, that's all. So well, this is the summary slide. I don't have much to say. I, I simply want to say our institute is trying to contribute to the cosmic ray and astroparticle physics. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice talk. <coughs> Questions? <coughs> yeah? Yeah, I have, oh. Oh, okay. yeah. I have a very naive question because it's about astrophysics. In the cosmic ray and isotropy in the blue show, the galactic center was blue, meaning that you have a lower flux of high energy cosmic rays there. So, how is that interpreted? Because we have the black hole where we have you know, all the action taking place. Thank you. Well, I'm very sorry. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, of course, there are theorists uh, telling us they can explain very well, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Nita san, for a very nice colloquium. I have a couple of questions. The first one is uh, in, in, with the super care results that you have, the 6.2 sigma uh, uh, number that, that you showed. Was that enough to rule out a neutrino decay uh, at that time? Which plot are you mentioning? For the uh, muon neutrino disappearance. Oh, muon neutrino disappearance, I see. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, this one. Yes. Yes. For yes. using super K result, was it possible to rule out the neutrino decay? Uh, well, okay, um, that, that spot was 98, and at that time, well, yes, we were unable to exclude the some kind of very tricky neutrino decay model. Uh, however, in 2004, we had a um, special analysis called NOBA analysis, and we used uh, only data, data events with only high NOBA resolutions. Then we showed the dip, the first oscillation dip. And with this data, we excluded the uh, neutrino decay model. Uh, and my second question is, is I, I'm looking at all these projects where the, where the Japanese scientific community is, is involved. And uh, could, you, could you please tell us a little bit your, your opinion on, on the benefits that brings to the uh, to Japan to participate in these uh, uh, collaborations outside of Japan, uh, even with all the huge investment uh, that it is made uh, for uh, IPRK, for example, with this uh, amount of money. But uh, what are all the benefits that, uh, that the European that brings to Japan uh, participating in uh, experiments, large collaborations outside of Japan? Oh, well, in my opinion, uh, well, in this size of experiments, International collaboration is just a natural thing. Um, we need many people, at least for the data analysis. 
clearly we, we need large collaboration. We need various ideas to get the maximum from each experiment. And any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can you I see, I see. So the question is, after some time, maybe the three mass state in, a, say, for example, original mu neutrino may be separated. Is it your question? Uh, uh, the question is that the three of them are different particles. Yes, yes, so, ma different mass. Uh, for example, you have a, a neutron and a, a proton, for example. No? They, have, they are different particles. Yes. The question is, if you match the, the momentum of the neutron and the proton, you give interference between the neutron and the proton. <laughs> very, very similar. Yeah, sorry. Maybe, uh, sorry, maybe later, uh, could you explain a little more? Uh, that question. Can I see this slide where you present the uh, isotropy from the alpaca experiment? Oh, well, not, not from alpaca. This is the summary of the... <laughs> I think so, yes. Oh, okay, yes, okay. yes, maybe, yes, maybe, because it's the, one of the work that uh, Hope with Ice Cube did, uh, Juan Carlos Diaz Vélez, este, he combined data from Hawk and Ice Cube at an energy of, the, of 10 TVs, and they found this anisotropy covering the, the both hemispheres, and uh -huh. this uh, missing piece. Now there are feeling. Mm -hmm. and so when I saw this slide, I was thinking uh, if it is, it is from the Tibet, okay, I, I know that map. But if not, maybe also this uh, cosmic ray and isotropy study can also be a very good way to link experiments like Alpaca, Ice Cube, Hawk. Yes, that's right, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> another question up there? Y si quieren preguntar en español, se lo traducimos. Así que, que eso no sea. Would it be possible for Hypergate to observe uh, evidence of this system of sterile neutrinos? Do you know? Sterile neutrinos, okay, thank you. Well, uh, Hyper K is actually not optimized to study sterile neutrinos. Therefore, I, I'm not optimistic about the studies of sterile neutrinos in Hyper K. Okay. Do you think well, is there enough evidence for existence? Or? Well, okay. We, I think, in my opinion, 
we have enough evidence of discrepancies among the data as far as we interpret them as sterile neutrinos. Okay, um, if we, I summarize, then certainly uh, uh, there must be, well, must be uh, extra galactic, and, but, uh, well, certainly um, they begin to see the excess um, along the super galactic plane. And therefore, well, now I think they begin to tell us the possible sources. Of course, at this moment, we are not sure. Alguna otra pregunta? Okay, if not, then we thank Professor Nikita.